the Winchester Model 1894, or just the Model 94. Hard to argue that it's probably one of the most iconic rifles in American history. With a legacy that spans over a century, continuing into present day, its impact is definitely obvious in the culture of the West, and I would say uh, in modern day too, with the modern rise of these tactical lever actions. Who would have thought? My name's Dwayne. This is The Gun Show. The original design comes from a fella by the name of John Moses Browning. You've probably not heard of him. He was just kind of a one-hit wonder. The Winchester Model 94 was introduced by Winchester Repeating Arms, of course, in 1894. And uh, as I mentioned to begin with, it would have one of the longest production runs of any gun in history. Uh, it's still going. Uh, they briefly stopped around 2006. I tried to find when they started back up again, but uh, as you can see from Winchester's website, they are pumping them out again, and man, are they expensive. But they look good. I've not had one of the new ones in my hands, but uh, it's certainly a fine-looking firearm, just like it always has been. Now, I, I chose the Winchester Model 94 as my first gun to review on the gun show, my inaugural launch of the gun show from Hunt, Shoot, Live. I chose it because it was actually my first gun, and unfortunately, I never got to shoot it. I never got to even lay hands on it. My dad purchased it. My dad was a gun guy. His dad was a gun guy. So when I was born, my dad bought uh, a Winchester. Don't even know what model it is, and my dad's long gone now. So uh, I think there might be a picture floating around somewhere. I have to talk to my mom about that. But I just know that it was a Winchester, and it uh, was a lever action. So it may not have been a 94, but having a 94, which I do, it hangs in my gun rack to this day. Um, you know, it reminds me of my dad and that cool con connection to, of course, I love guns. And, and that was one of the first gifts that my dad got me, or that was the first gift my dad got me. So anyway, the Winchester Model 1894 can be referred to as the 1894 or the Model 94. I would argue dependent on when the gun was released. So all of the originals beginning from 1894 up to around 1927, until they made that one millionth Model 1894, they were called and stamped as 1894. Now, after that point in time, they were just called the Model 94. So if you look on yours and, and it was made after 1927, it's going to say Winchester Model 94. It won't say Model 1894. So I guess you could say that all of these Model 94s could be called the Model 94, but only those pre-1927 could be called the 1894. Now, um, interestingly enough, that one millionth one was given to President Calvin Coolidge, and it is currently on display in the Cody Firearms Museum. Now, i got to say, just a real quick plug for the Cody Firearms Museum. That That is a combination of like four different museums there. And if you've never been, I strongly encourage you to go. You need multiple days just to go through all of those museums. But just the Cody Firearms Museum by itself was just overwhelming, the number of guns and the, and the history and the things that you could spend time there looking into. So definitely check that out. Cody was a really cool town as well. Now, I think it's worth taking a minute just to talk about lever actions in general, uh, breaking away from the 94 and, and kind of seeing where it came from. The first successful lever action is generally attributed to being the Volcanic Repeating Arms, or from the Volcanic Repeating Arms Company, founded by Horace Smith and Daniel B. Wesson. If that sounds familiar, it, it probably should. That would be where Smith and Wesson came from, those two gentlemen, though unfortunately their volcanic rifle did not really take off, but it certainly set the stage for our Model 94 and all other lever actions after that. So the volcanic was introduced in the 1850s and uh, certainly was one of the earliest, if not the first, to use that lever-operated mechanism. The volcanic was definitely innovative. Its main problem was that it had a pretty crappy design for its bullet and propellant. They basically would just take the bullet and drill into the back of it. There was no metallic cartridge. Um, it, it just had a bullet with a hole drilled in it. You put the 
powder in it, a very small amount of powder, and then they corked it off. And you know your your primer would ignite and, or ignite through the cork and and set it off. It it, it was very underwhelming. Uh, I think speeds around like 400 to 500 feet per second. So it didn't catch on, and uh, the Volcanic Repeating Arms Company faced some financial difficulties pretty quickly, and they were reorganized into the New Haven Arms Company in 1857. At that time, Benjamin Tyler Henry, an engineer and designer, uh, he made some pretty crucial improvements on that volcanic design, resulting in the famous Henry rifle. Now, don't confuse this with Henry repeating arms. They are honoring his namesake, certainly, and Henry repeating arms is known for their lever action rifles, but they were not formed until 1996 uh, by fellows by the name of Louis and Anthony Imperato. And I apologize, guys, if I got your name wrong. So the Henry was a hit. And uh, introduced in the early 1860s, uh, it was a direct evolution, as I mentioned, from the Volcanic, but um, it had some major improvements in its cartridge using the 44 Henry Rimfire. Uh, it actually doubled the speed, and uh, as mentioned, that was pretty much what was lacking in the Volcanic. It wasn't the design, it was the, the, the cruddy cartridge. So the 44 rimfire in that Henry rifle uh, did the trick, bumping it up to around 1,000 feet per second or better. So now we're getting somewhere. In 1866, the New Haven Arms was renamed as Winchester Repeating Arms, and they launched their model 1866. It was basically the Henry with just a slight mod or two, and it's commonly known as the Yellow Boy. That's uh, because of its pretty distinctive brass receiver. It's a really good rifle gained uh, popularity really quickly and um, provided another stepping stone definitely going in the right direction for Winchester. Uh, it was chambered in various rimfire cartridges uh, including of course the 44 Henry rimfire and later uh, more versatile 44-40 um, Winchester centerfire cartridge. Up next came the Winchester Model 1873. This is often referred to as the gun that won the West. And from what I've read online, it seems to carry a lot of weight as one of the most famous lever guns of all time. I would say the Winchester Model 94 would have to be more famous. I'm sure people could argue with me about that, but hey, it's still being made today. So that's got a lot for it, but I guess the 94 was not the gun that won the West. Apparently the 1873 was, so again we're getting some rapid jumps in technology, everything's continuing to move in the right direction for Winchester, people are loving them, and then in 1894 they come out with the next iteration, which is our beloved Model 94. Now initially it was only available in uh, some pistol cartridges, the 3240, the 3855, you had several other cartridges coming out later on, the 2535, of course, over its history, it's been in all kinds of different calibers, 44, 45 Colt, 70, 30, 357, uh, 32 Winchester, 218B, 22 Hornet, I'm probably missing a ton. Um, most famously, though, I would argue most famously, because in my opinion, this one was the game changer. The 3030 Winchester was released, or it was initially known as the 30 Winchester Centerfire. This was the first commercially available sporting rifle cartridge to use smokeless powder. Now, there were a couple other uh, military guns. Um, the French came out with the 80 by 50 millimeter R Labelle. That was around 1886. Uh, the British had the 303 British, 1892. Come on, America. We were coming in a little late. Uh, the 30 US uh, or the 3040 Crag was in 1894. So actually just a year before it was released or something similar, you know, the 30 WCF or 3030 Winchester was, was released to the commercial market a year later. The, the military had only adopted that the year prior. So coming in a little late there, it's okay. I guess our military is doing a little better today than then. But um, anyway, the, the 3030 was a huge improvement. You know, we had already bumped up. That initial volcanic was around 500 feet per second, and we bumped up to around 1,000 feet per second with the Henry and, and the early Winchesters. And then here with the 1894, with that 3030, you're getting up to 1,700 feet per second, uh, 1,900 feet per second. I think the, those 160 grain bullets were going around 19. 
1970, something like that. So smoking, smoking fast. I, I could imagine that, I mean, that would almost be like somebody taking an AR-15, a hundred round mag and, and a case of ammo and then going back in time a hundred years, you know, from now uh, or back from, from current time, you know, you would just be inserting yourself at such a major advantage. And that definitely was the case here. You know, they're, they're definitely, um, if you listen to a lot about these old West outlaws and things, a lot of those guys could get shot and shot and shot and not die, man, you get shot with a 30, 30, it's uh, going to be a bad day. So this was a jump forward, just light years of improvement for power and desirability. I mean, the performance that you get with that 30-30, we still use it now. People still hunt with it, especially in the, where I live around here. Uh, thick woods, people love the 30-30 and it gets the job done. It was capable of withstanding greater pressures, of course, so that smokeless powder was able to uh, give people what they wanted. And, you know, over the years, uh, that just ramped up the, the Winchester's popularity. And, and at this point, you know, you can get it in all kinds of different barrel lengths and configurations and commemorative editions and uh, you name it. Um, you know, it's been featured in various movies and, and Western shows over the years. Uh, Stagecoach, um, the movie Winchester 73, even though that was about 1873, it had the Winchester Model 94 in it. Uh, it was a common appearance in, in the Rifleman TV show. Several other movies, most notably to me anyway, is the uh, Model 94 that they use in Terminator 2. Uh, he's riding on the motorcycle. He's working that lever action with one arm, and it's like a, it's like a futuristic shotgun model 94. So, you know, its impact is, is undeniable. And uh, still today, people are loving now these, these modern uh, lever action, tactical, whatever they are. I don't know how I feel about them, but the, the impact of the model 94 cannot be denied. Now let's talk a little, little bit about uh, the, the changes over the different time periods of the Winchester. It seems like there are some pretty fixed points on when you can say that yours is desirable, uh, like from a collector's standpoint, um, certainly people disagree a lot on this. I, I notice in threads there's a lot of opinions going back and forth. But regardless of what your opinion about the quality is, there's definitely some time periods that we can pinpoint and, and we can note some changes from those times. So obviously the, the first one that we could point out that's a pretty easy one would be if you've got one of those original model 1894s that would be pre-1927 when that last one was given to President Coolidge uh, before it turned to just simply the 94 obviously that would be something that would be highly desirable and there were only a million of them. After that millionth one, they became the Model 94. So there's been over 7 million of the Model 94s produced, and only a million of them. That first million was the Model 1894. So that would be highly desirable. Now the next period that seems to be a marker for determining collectability is that pre-war, so 1942 and, and prior to that, um, they actually stopped production for a couple years and didn't kick it back up until uh, around September of 1945. So you've got pre-war and post-war is something that collectors look at there. Now, there seems to be some argument on this uh, online on various forums, but um, uh, the general consensus seems to be that production was just higher post-war and they began to rely a little more on machines as opposed to prior to that. Maybe they were relying more on your what you would consider to traditional um, gunsmith quality builds. So some do argue that the pre-war are made better than the post-war. Now, there is also the final dividing line. Uh, well, maybe not the final dividing line because now we've got these modern ones. Uh, but pre-64 and post-64 is definitely something that uh, is, is a pretty good indicator as to the collectability of your Model 94. The pre-64s were definitely made of, and people are going to light me up for this comment, I'm sure, but uh, they were made of better components. And, and post-64, uh, Winchester just made the move to produce more and cut costs and, and that kind of thing. And we see it happen now. 
So it's not necessarily to say that um, it's worse quality stuff, but I mean, some probably would say that. You know, they were um, one of the changes was to begin using sheet metal pressing in, in some of those internal parts instead of the cast parts. Um, so I can see why the, the cast parts would be more desirable, certainly. So if you've got a pre-64, you may be a little more of a, you may have a little more of a collectible firearm, a little more of a desirable firearm than a post-64. Now, mine is a post-64, and I love mine. I have no problem with it. Best I could figure from checking the serial number. Of course, the serial number, if you look under your, uh, under your handguard there, the, the, the metal part at the fore end, you should have a number stamped on it. And uh, I'll include a link in the video description for a forum that I found that had a pretty good list of, of serial numbers. Um, within that, I had found a link to the Cody Museum and, and really couldn't make any sense of, of that. So, uh, But I'll, I'll include the forum that I found, and hopefully you can follow your number and find what year yours was produced. But uh, uh, I did find some other information on how you can maybe kind of identify at least was yours pre-war or uh, post-war or pre-64, all that kind of thing. Looks like anything pre-war has diagonal screws on the receiver. Um, the post-64 has the screws lining directly on top of one another. There's, there's two screws. So if they're diagonal, you've got a pre-64. If they're right on top of each other, horizontal, then that is a post-64. Also, the pre-64 models have a screw on the bottom of the receiver, or it would be on the, the, the lever handle there of the action, and the post-64s do not have that screw. Another dividing line later on would be the introduction of the angle eject. Now, that was introduced around 1983, and you can look at your gun side profile and if it has that cut out then it is going to be an angle eject that would have to be after 1983 anything before that is not going to have that cut out on it so winchester has uh, changed hands a few times and this was also a little confusing so please uh, give me some comments if, if if i'm getting this wrong but it looks like fn owns browning and Browning Arms Company purchased Winchester Repeating Arms, uh, or at least the name, maybe. Uh, that's what was a little confusing. It, it was almost like the, the Winchester Repeating Arms name was just bought by Browning, and Winchester Repeating Arms maybe runs just like it did, even though Browning owns the name, <laughs> but then FN owns Browning, so that's a little confusing. You guys can help me out there in the comments if, if you uh, have make a little better sense of that than, than what I could. But that's interesting to know. Of course, I love Brownings and I love FN. Uh, so uh, certainly doesn't hurt my feelings that that, that would have ownership there. But uh, it's a little bit muddled up, I guess, in how all of that works. But they're obviously doing something right because after over 120 years, it's still being made. Uh, Winchester did discontinue it for a little while, starting in 2006, and I tried to find when they kicked it back up, and I could not find that. I couldn't get a clear answer as to when they started again, but go to their website. You can see them. Nice, beautiful, brand new Winchester Model 94s in several different options on their website, and they're a little bit pricier than I thought they would be, but everything's pricey now, so... Anyway, the Winchester Model 94, it'll certainly keep a place on my gun rack as long as I live. And my son, he already loves to shoot it, so it'll get handed down to him gladly. It's a combination of reliability and power, that iconic design. It has, in my opinion, ensured its legacy as a firearm that will forever be associated with freaking awesomeness. The rugged Wild West, good old mountain deer gun, brush gun, if there is such a thing. I would imagine it will forever hold a place in our hearts and most definitely in our hands. My name is Dwayne from Hunt, Shoot, Live, and this is The Gun Show.